What's up, kid folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Welcome to episode two of the number one ranked show. And it is a massive show as we're going to talk with Wondell Moore a little bit later. And because he is such a workout monster, we're going to get into the top five workout monsters ahead of NFL drafts. But first, on National Signing Day, the class of 2021, its top recruit, signed with no one. And with less than five months until the season starts, defensive lineman JT Tuimolau is still unsigned. As his number three overall ranking suggests, he could be selected among the first five picks of the NFL draft in just three years' time. At six foot five, 277 pounds, he's another one of these kiddos who is built like he's been injected with the super serum. He's fluid, he's quick, and he's powerful. And that power is dynamic and could prove so pivotal that he can make a program dynastic. Each recruiting cycle almost always has at least one high profile star who hasn't settled on a school yet for reasons, as one prospect told me. And those reasons, in Tui Molau's case, are ones many can respect. He simply has not officially visited all the schools among the five finalists he's considering, Alabama, Ohio State, Washington, Oregon, and USC. He stepped onto UW's campus for the first time in almost 15 months this month to take in the Huskies' open practice. But his family is from Southern California, and he has attended Eastside Catholic in Washington. He traveled to Tuscaloosa once, but that was two years ago for a camp, and he has never visited Ohio State. With the NCAA's dead period in effect for over a year now, no high school recruit has been allowed to go to any school for an official visit. That will change in June as the NCAA will allow in-person recruiting for the first time since March 2020. And the kiddos are raring to go as coaches steal themselves for the chaos to come. As Pat Fitzgerald told The Athletic, it's going to be wild, it's going to be crazy. I told my wife that I'll see her in July. We're going on vacation. Some recruits took unofficials on their own during the dead period, but could not meet coaches or staff, which means they missed nearly everything that goes on inside the programs. Many were forced to make their 40-year decision on little more than a Zoom call, but Tui Molau ain't going out like that. He is at a crossroads in his life where he not only is making a big decision, but also holds the power to bend college football coaches to his needs for perhaps the last time. He's smart not to decide until he feels comfortable. What's smarter still is that he doesn't have to or get to sign a national letter of intent. Instead, he can sign a financial aid agreement. And therein, as Robert Caro would tell us, lies the power broker. A national letter of intent binds the player to the university for a period of one year, at which point the university has the option to renew it. There's no such thing as a four-year scholarship. Just ask the Dabo Sweeney stand-in in the made-for-TV movie called Safety. But a financial aid agreement doesn't bind the player to the school at all. However, it binds the university to uphold its financial obligation if the player chooses to enroll. Again, allow me to emphasize this is an all-power-to-the-player type move. Another perk, a player can sign an NLI with only one university, but a financial aid agreement? A player can sign a financial aid agreement with an unlimited number of universities and colleges. All power to the player. As one college football administrator told me, that's where the college football free agency is. We've effectively signed a contract saying, we'll pay you this amount while watching you shop around. It is a win for the players. Right. For me, this is like Dak Prescott negotiating with Jerry Jones, staring down year two of paying Dak franchise tag level loot. That negotiation was as much about how stiff Dak's back is and the sheer lack of legitimately great NFL QBs in the league on the regular. Just as there are a set of rules for Dak and the small constellation of stars in the league and a set of rules for the remaining 1,600 players in the NFL, there are a set of rules for the 35 stars among the 3,200 seniors who get to sign a piece of paper that guarantees a debt-free start to higher education in trade for their body's prodigious talent used for profit. This arrangement is crucial 
during December and January when the coaching carousel starts moving like a million dollar centrifuge. While Ohio State is the leader, Saban is there in the mix. And who says he couldn't add another five star to his bounty? Not me, but that's beside the point. The nail head to hammer here is the slow roll to player agency in the secondary definition of the word according to Merriam Webster. An action or intervention, especially such as to produce a particular effect. Name, image, and likeness are coming. The one-time transfer rule is here. The days of the straight scholarship barter system are numbered. A modernization is imminent. Playoff expansion is circling the cowards. You won't be able to hide from us for much longer behind that power five fortress. As the money pie grows, so too must the number of seats at the table. And dog, we hungry. As hungry as you are to sign JT Tui Molau and Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning and any elite prospect that can help you rebuild and reload to chase glory. Now I wanna talk with Rondell Moore who had some really interesting things to say about being the dude that picked Purdue, coming out of there with his degree and the price of lumber. Let's talk to Rondell Moore. Rondell Moore, welcome to the number one ranked show. I appreciate you being here, man. No doubt, man. I appreciate you having me on. Right on. I want to start with the superlatives. True freshman year, you set a single season record for all purpose yards with over 2,000 at Purdue. You have 313 against Northwestern, and you finish the season with 114 catches. And yet, I'm still floored by this statistic, and I want to know if you were floored by it. You were one of three guys to earn All-American as a freshman. The other two, Herschel Walker and Adrian Peterson, how does that feel to you? Uh, it's, it's inspiring, honestly, to be mentioned uh, amongst those two names. Uh, so to be alongside those guys, I think, for me personally, is inspiring, like I said, and it motivates me to, you know, work even harder to, you know, one day hopefully obtain the success that they, they've had. Well, it wasn't always that way, right? Matter of fact, I'm going to read back to you a quote that Elijah Sindelar gave in a profile of you. And I thought it was funny because I've been described <laughs> in much the same way. This kid looks like a child. He has braces, a baby face, and he was shy. My first impression is he's short. How in the world are we going to throw to this man? And then a few practices in, you showed out. But how often do you get met with that? Uh, I think more so now than, than ever, simply because I think at this point in my life, it's what can he not do and uh, how can we pick him apart? But I think as, as a younger guy, it's all been just get in the room and go show your talent. And that's what I've had the opportunity to do. And um, Coach Brown gave me an opportunity to go highlight all my strengths. So... Um, I think more so now, but you know, growing up and that kind of stuff, it was just playing ball and didn't get too concerned about it. You had to really trust Coach Brom, though. When did you know that you were going to be able to do all the things in that offense that you were allowed to do? I mean, as soon as I walked through the door, crazy enough. So I had the playbook early, so I was able to, um, you know, learn the plays, concepts, and understand what was going on. I think in the college, it was more so adjusting and just being able to handle the transition. But I did have, you know, great coaches and great teammates uh, and David Blau, who was a fifth year senior at the time, who helped me tremendously um, with my development and just learning the playbook. But I mean, hats off to Coach Shep, Coach Brown, um, and all the coaches at Purdue who just poured so much into me. Uh, so I was able to hit the ground running. But the trust uh, came early on with Coach Brown. I mean, as a running back at New Albany, he was at WKU. When I was at New Albany, he was at WKU. I got a chance to go take an unofficial there. We got to sit down and um, you know, talk ball. I got to watch a game. So we, we built some rapport early and then I transferred to Trinity and he graduated from there. So he was frequently in and out and uh, we got a chance to speak a few times and I got on campus and we just hit it off. All right. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Were you actually going to go to WKU? No doubt. About, I would have, like I said, I was a sophomore at the time. I didn't, I didn't have any uh, looks, if you will. Um, and like I said, relationships and, and trust, goes a long way uh, for me um, and my family as well. So, uh, I mean, there's there's no doubt in my mind if Coach Brom would have stayed at WKU, it would have definitely been on the table for me. I find that interesting because your recruiting journey is wild, right? And I want to go through it piece by piece so people understand. But you start out at New Albany where you, you mm -hmm. play in ball, 
but you also are a hooper. So, like, right. when did you make the transition? Because it's one thing to be playing with Romeo Langford and winning yeah. state championships, and it's another thing to become the kind of NFL draft prospect you are today. So how did you go from New Albany to Trinity? Yeah, so, <clears throat> I mean, like you said, I my freshman year at New Albany, I played basketball, I ran track, I played football. Crazy enough, I played quarterback my freshman year. My sophomore year, I played running back. Uh, and then on the basketball court, obviously, I played point guard. And, um, I mean, I've been playing row since AAU days. And, you know, we were rivals back in eighth grade and that kind of stuff. But, um, I, like, my sophomore year, like you said, we got a chance to win a state championship. And for me, it was making the decision uh, for the future. And I knew I wasn't <laughs> – I'm not going to say I knew I wasn't. But I guess reality set in um, that I wasn't going to go to the NBA <laughs> – so I decided, you know, I was I was going to put the ball down and, and play football. So I decided to transfer uh, to Trinity, which is about 20 minute commute for me, just right across the bridge in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and that's that's when I got locked in with, with just playing football. But you weren't allowed to play right away, right? right? You had been suspended for what they thought was illegal recruiting, whether or not that went down. Like, how did you feel about having to sit out for as long as you did? Now, so it was just like not illegal recruiting. It was literally just transfer rules from state to state. Um, okay. And it was something they had to get handled with the KHSA, AA, or IS, whatever. And um, it took a while to figure that out. And first I was denied and appealed it. I had to appeal it like two or three different times. So basically I set out that whole season, uh, missed the first round of the playoffs. And a guy that I think so much to this day, because he just was so important to me, um, even as just – helping me just maneuver through life, you know, as a young man and obviously on the football field. But Andrew Coverdale was the offensive coordinator at the time. Uh, I met him my junior year. And like I said, I was ineligible. So I sat in the press box for every practice. Uh, he gave me a script and I, I learned the the concepts and the, what we were doing. Um, I attended 7 a.m. quarterback meetings before school and he just taught me so much. And this was how I was able to get to Purdue as a 17 year old on campus and, and, you know, pick up everything swiftly. But um, I got to play four games that year and, and I think it was his objective to literally just throw me the wall every time. I think I had like 20 catches, 10 touchdowns and like 500 receiving yards. Uh, we got a chance to win a state championship that year. And then my senior year, uh, I got to play the full season. We went undefeated again and won another state championship. Well, thank you for correcting me on the transfer rules. I appreciate no that. Worries. Keep, keep, keep me on. Right. But also talking about ending up at Trinity and how important a junior year is for recruiting. Like, that's, that's the year you pop. That's the year you can start taking your officials. That's the weird year the offers <clears> become <throat> real. Were you at all worried that folks were going to miss out on just how good you were? Not really. And I say that because when I couldn't, I had two offers at the time. So regardless of how it went down, I, I knew I had two on the table that I could choose from. And it was Kentucky, which was my first, and IU, which was my second. And I had those two. Um, while I was ineligible, I actually picked up Austin P. Crazy enough. But uh, so I pretty much had three. Um, and I knew I was doing everything on my end uh, to be ready when, when my name was called and when I was able to go out there and play. So I wasn't too worried about it. And I knew um, that I basically had the right people in my corner that could assist me with, you know, getting recruited and talking to the right people. So um, I, I did everything I could do on my end or that I could control to get back and hit the ground running. And I was able to do so. So you're short, but boy, you fast, like you can move. I remember hearing the stories about you dropping 4-3-3 at, Nike, at the Nike Open, I believe, it was at a regional. And that right. was what I was led to believe is when your recruiting really started to take off. Is that what happened? Yeah, I mean, after that, I pretty much, like that same night in the hotel, I probably got 10 different coaches that followed me on Twitter. Um, and then from there, it just went crazy. Cause I had got texts from coaches like, yo, we need to see you come camp. Um, we don't know this, we don't know that. I ran that and it was like, hey, yo, give us a call next week. And I was just getting offered. I was the average of probably two, three offers a day. So how did you end up first committing to Texas then? Uh, so we, I had a mutual connection, um, with a guy named Will Stein, who's, I mean, no longer there anymore, but, um, he kind of put me on to Texas and, uh, I, I took an unofficial, I took an official, um, I've been to Texas a few others. I have some family out there and obviously I played in San Antonio for the all American game, but I've been out there a few times and, 
uh, I mean, I'm from the Midwest, so it's, it's cold here and the warm weather was really enticing to me. The facilities were great. I think Texas had a lot to offer. Uh, Drew was the receiver coach at the time. I think um, he was really intelligent of the game and that's what I um, admired the most about, about Drew. Um, I, I thought he would have been able to develop me um, as a receiver and, you know, just further my knowledge of the game. But when it came down to it, it was really three things that mattered the most to me. One was relationships. And I, I value that the most. Um, two was being able to get my degree in three years. So sitting down with the academic staff and figuring out literally how many classes do I have to take? When do I take them? Um, and how fast can I get it done? Well, while not like just spinning out, but uh, those two. And then the third one would be how I would be utilizing the offense and Fortunately for me, Purdue happened to uh, keep in contact with me throughout that time and um, kind of checked off all those boxes. So I ended up decommitting, um, taking an unofficial to Purdue, and we, we kind of finalized it, and that's where I ended up. Yo, man, I feel like you, you're making light of one step in particular because I watched your announcement, and you had, tell the folks the hats you had and the hat you pulled out. Yeah, I had Florida State, Ohio State, Bama, and Purdue. And you pulled Purdue out, right. which shocked so many of us. But all those things that you mentioned are things that you really yeah. valued. And I appreciate that you decided to do what was best for you and still made it work because you, for me, are an example of the kind of player who will bet on himself as much as anybody else. So when you get to Purdue, one of the stories that I also heard is that you would call David Blau up at one in the morning asking what you're supposed to be doing on this play in this scheme against this defense. Is that, exa is that exactly how it went down? Uh, very, very similar. So I pretty much just the script. So when we started camp, the scripts were always in the quarterback room uh, and I figured that out. So I went in there and I grabbed every script from every day. Um, so I could literally write down the concept, write down what I had, and then eventually I would call David and be like, yo, what does everyone have on this play? So I could figure out like, what's my job here? Um, and then from there, after I learned all of that, uh, we further, we got into like defenses and like, okay, this is this, this is that. Uh, and then eventually it all clicked for me. The game slowed down and I was able to go out there and play ball. Immediately, immediately, right? But one of the things that I've also heard about you is you are such a perfectionist that you don't remember the catches, you remember the drops. So what was that first pass attempt at Northwestern? What did you do with the ball? I dropped it. <laughs> and then what happened? Uh, they didn't take me out. We called a run play the next play. We came back to that same exact play later that drive or later in that game. Um, the same exact thing happened. I saw it in practice, and I'm like, I ain't dropping this one, but... Uh, we, we literally came back to the same play and I ended up scoring a touchdown. Then later on, 2018, October 20th, you, you, you cross your arms like show enough and you let Ohio State know that playtime is over. Tell me, how are you feeling in the middle of that? 12 catches, 170 yards, just tearing up that defense. Man, everything was clicking for us that night, all three phases of the game. And I don't know how much you know about Tyler Trent and his story, but um, was a huge fan of ours and, and a great person. And unfortunately, he had uh, cancer and, and isn't, you know, with us today, but um, ended up being a great friend of mine. And, you know, we had his support that night. And like I said, I think we, we just had all the luck, um, if you will, that night. What is something that you picked up from Tyler during your time with him that you can take with you? In the midst of chaos, uh, it's important to, to keep your faith. And that's something, you know, we like we got a chance to exchange numbers after uh, the game in the locker room. And uh, we kept consistent contact, you know, up until the day he passed. But um, like in the midst of everything that was going on and his pain and his hurt, he always made sure everyone else around him was OK and checking on them. And you are that kind of person. You are that kind of player. No doubt. I think it's important to check on your friends, check on your family, because you just, you know, never know with everything that's going on. So I think, um, you know, over yourself and making sure everything is right on your end, it's important to go make sure everyone else is, is you know, stable, you know, mentally, physically, and um, everything else. 
So from this relationship with Tyler, from the relationship with Coach Brom, and knowing what Purdue means for you, what does it mean to you that you get to represent them in this way on this stage where you are being penciled in by some as a first-round draft pick at wide receiver? Forever grateful. And that's on the football side of things. That's on the corporate America side of things. I had a chance to intern with a guy who graduated from Purdue, who's now the CEO of a staffing firm in Indy. And uh, I've learned so much and got a chance. Let let me jump in there. You sought out an internship while you were playing division one football. Taking 27 hours as well. So nine classes. and (laughs) Yeah. No, please tell me, tell me about this internship. Yeah, so uh, Seth Morales is his name, but um, and he's with Morales Group, which is a staffing firm uh, based in Indy. They, I mean, they have a plethora of locations, but uh, I basically got a chance to work half with the sales team and half with the marketing team. And, and I was cold calling. I was um, working on ads. I was uh, like putting information, like I, everything you could imagine as as a um, as a sales rep um working you know with the marketing like everything you can imagine i think he put me through it um and i got a chance to connect with some high business owners i got a chance to sit uh in the meetings where they talk about real numbers and talk about goals and things of that sort so i think it was really important in my development and what i want to do after football um and just getting a little experience of what it would be like so you know i can't thank him enough and you know we have consistent contact to this day be specific what do you want to do after football I think now for me, I real estate is, is going to be the route I want to take and specifically commercial, but uh, obviously that'll, it may take me a little bit. <laughs> hey man, that's the route. as my mother would say, good Lord ain't making any more land. If you, you can get you some, get you some. Now that's what's up. So you have this internship, you're putting together an all American season and you also are an academic all American. But again, you being a perfectionist, you really still upset that you got an 89 9 and didn't get an A? Twice. That happened to me twice in my time at Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was crazy because it's, it's like in these two classes, one, they didn't offer any extra credit, and two, they didn't round up. So I was stuck with those, those 89s. I mean, obviously, I tried to email them and whatnot, but uh, it didn't work out for me. No, nah, man, like, <clears throat> that's cold. Like, for real. Like, you know, I'm teaching in grad school. You the email, we to figure something out. 89, nine, just get them yeah. in the A. But you walk out yeah. with 3.71 that first year. You graduate mm-hmm. two and a half years. Is that correct? Right. So you walk in the NFL with your degree with the least amount of time. No doubt. Man, that's what's up. All right. Let me ask you what I think is an important question, but a difficult question. After the 2018 mm-hmm. season that you had, and then missing so much of the 2019 season with the hamstring, and then opting out of COVID, and then back in when they were playing, and then you had to quit playing once again. Have you played your best football? I think early on as an 18-year-old, I was the best person on the field in every game we played in. Um, And when I say that, I I really didn't know what's going on. I was playing off pure confidence um, and what everything I had learned, I think, and my three years at Purdue, I learned so much every year. Um, and I can't thank the guys there enough for the knowledge and, you know, little nuances to, you know, just go about handling business. But uh, like you said, man, I think personally my, my best football is, is ahead of me. So I think of myself as a person who is not even supposed to be here. I am blessed to be in the position that I'm in. And when I think about your story and how you got to this space, being born premature, right? The baby of the babies to a baby, right? And your mother, Quincy Ricketts. Right. How do you feel about your journey? Does it feel like it could only happen to you? Does it feel like it was destined? How does it feel? Yeah, I I don't really, not a huge believer in luck, but I do think luck does favor those who work hard. And uh, I think hard work was instilled in me early and I got to see it firsthand from my mother. So I just continued to um, not come up for air, keep my head down and, and just grind. And I, I don't really set goals or anything like that. I just, you know, when I when I do come up for air, everything that I can imagine is has been, you know, uh, which within arm's reach. So, 
that's that's a, that's kind of how I've taken this whole journey and just tried to stay um, close to those who have been a part of the process and you know just stay humble throughout it all. So one of the questions I usually give to the draft prospects like yourself is what's going to be your first purchase, but you already gave that answer. So I'm just going to ask, has your mama picked out a house yet? Crazy enough, I, like two days ago, we just went to look at a house, but she's probably looked at about eight or nine. Uh, the market is insane right now as far as like the cost of everything. Like lumber is like three times the price and it's just, it's tough right now. But um, definitely my mother's house will be the first purchase. Time out. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a homeowner and I have right. never heard a man this young be able to tell me about the price of lumber, how much materials cost, and what the market is doing. Like, do you understand, from my perspective, how rare that is and how far ahead you are? Well, I, it's a little different for me, obviously, because I'm in the process and I don't really just give all the information to someone else and say, figure it out. I like to be in the loop. So um, especially when we're talking about like finances, I'm as frugal as they come. So. <laughs> I like to make sure I'm getting uh, everything I'm paying for. Now that's what's up. All right, so more football. Who is the player that you most model your game after? I, I think the correct answer is is Tyreek, and I think we do a lot of a lot of similar things, but I think we're different in, in a lot of ways as well. But I think in today's game, um, how he plays, obviously, I think he plays a lot faster than I do, but. Uh, we do a lot of the same stuff. Well, I mean, that's not a bad thing from a speed, from a catching ability, from the way that they use him. I could see how that works for you. Right. Who is the player that you most admire in the NFL? Admire? Oh, I think that's a weird word because I don't really have a really close relationship with mm. like anyone at the receiver position in the NFL, so it's kind of hard to admire someone I don't know and I don't really know much about them but there's a few guys that I, I enjoy watching and studying for sure I think Diggs is at on that list Keenan Allen Cooper Cup uh, Cole Beasley I mean I name I name these guys every time but I enjoy watching those guys win because they all bring something who are some of the guys you played with that you admire then that I played with mm -hmm. one David Blau and I'll, I'll I'll say that forever just because I like he works extremely hard and his situation is just like mine. I mean, isn't the tallest quarterback um, probably can't throw an 80 yard bomb um, and, you know, all the intangibles that people look for, but he does have heart and, you know, he studies his butt off and, and works extremely hard. So David, I think uh, Blau, David Bell, George Karloftis, there's some younger guys coming up. I think Corey tries to be really good. Um, so those are some guys I, I played with at Purdue who, who I'm excited uh, for their futures, and I think they work hard and will be really good players. Yo, man, tell me about this dude, David Bell. Like, I saw a little bit last year. I like what I saw. What is he capable of? I think the sky's the limit for him. He has all the intangibles to be a great receiver. I think body control is his his best trait. Um, 50, 50 balls to him are like 80, 20. Uh, tracks the ball very well. Um, has sneaky speed. And I know he'll run past you. So um, he's really smooth and in and out of his breaks and as a route runner. So I think the sky's the limit for David. So I'm at the opening final in 2018. And I'm looking at the class of 2019, looking at some of the dudes that got invitations from the class of 2020. And this man, George Karlaftis, just kept showing up. Is he that way in practice? Yeah, he's go-go gadget. He, uh, huge motor, man. He, um, uh, like doesn't take a playoff and he's always concerned about how he can get better. And, you know, he puts the right things in his body. He gets the proper amount of sleep, whatever research he's has to do on the back end to figure out how to perform. He's going to do it. Um, and, you know, some people call him crazy, but I guess that's what comes along with being great. So again, a couple short Kings. Yeah. You know I mean, mm -hmm. so I'm going to ask this and I need you to think about it. Who is All the right. best player, not named you under six feet tall, walking the face of the earth. Steve Smith. Yo! Look at you! Pulling out with the old <laughs> head. All right, so why is it Steve Smith? Uh, Every intangible but being tall, I think he has. Um, toughness, quickness, hands, uh, the ability to pretty much do anything. Um, 
And I think he he possesses all those qualities, and that's what made him uh, such a great receiver. Yo, man, for, for years it was him and Cam Newton and whomever else they could throw out there. Nah, that's what's up. Steve Smith coming out of you. So <laughs> have you been studying the game from the jump, or did you start – I am going to be a professional football player in high school. But like you said, I, I had hoop dreams. So I was, I was playing basketball and I, I had NFL dreams. I mean, NBA dreams. Like I want to play in the NBA, but uh, I, I kind of got, I guess, into the position. Like I said, I transitioned to full-time receiver my junior year. And then from there, I think my film study started and uh, started looking at guys and, and how they won. One of the things that I found to be most interesting about, again, your journey is getting back to this recruiting and how you end up at Purdue. Do you feel that it is important that players understand the fit that they're going to have or that they're going to be able to play Power 5 football? Because Purdue's a Power 5 team in the Big Ten, but it's not what we think of as a traditional power. And a lot of kiddos don't have the opportunity to really pick and choose in that way. When they do... What are the things you want them to really focus on? It varies for everyone. And I can't speak for everybody out there, but you basically got to go to a place where they, they value um, what you do. And if they're not going to tailor the offense to fit your play style, therefore you got to go somewhere where it, it's already a thing. So at Purdue specifically, and for me, uh, it's a spread offense. Do we have some pro style concepts where we'll go 12 personnel or 21 and, and put some some tight ends on the field? No doubt about it. But um, we're a spread offense and, and Coach Brown will put five receivers on the field and, and we'll go a whole series and, and not put it back out there. So uh, I think for me as a pass catcher or as a slot receiver or as an outside receiver, um, I think it's uh, there's limitless opportunities to go out there and win and showcase what you can do in a space. How difficult has it been for you to hear all of these other wide receivers being picked ahead of you in these mock drafts? I don't pay attention to mock drafts. Okay. Why? Uh, like I said, I, 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 like you said, I mean, I bet on myself and I know I'm doing everything in my power that I can control to be the best player I can be. And I think I've done everything um, as a 17 year old when I, when I got to college. Um, I mean, I have no baggage. I've done everything the right way. So I think at this point, whatever's supposed to happen is gonna happen. Um, and any opportunity I'll get, I'll, I'll stay true to what I've been doing and, and surround myself with the right people in order to put myself in the best position possible to go win. All right, man, take care of everything you can take care of. All right, you see, we, we love superheroes here, right? We are about comic books. So I'm going to ask you this. Which superhero are you most like? I don't really get into, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's a tough one for me because I don't know. <laughs> what? what? I, I'm going to say this simply because I think this is just the politically correct answer, Superman. And, and I can't okay. tell you why. I cannot you tell, tell you me why. why. You can't tell me why. All right, you gonna go with Superman? I mean, the X-ray vision, laser vision can fly all over. Any of those things appeal to you? Fly all over. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so superheroes are not your thing. What is one right. of the ways in which you spend your downtime? Uh, video games. I mean, Call of Duty. I play Warzone with my friends. Two uh, K. I play in the park. I don't really play Madden that much. I will occasionally, but. 2K and, and, and Warzone are my go-to uh, things. And then, I mean, I'm at home now, so I get a chance to uh, be with my family and just, you know, debrief and, and chill and uh, enjoy enjoy them. So Warzone, one of the things I always tell parents of if they don't understand and they're not really video game fans is the hand-eye coordination. Does it help with your hand-eye coordination? Does it help with your quick twitch? <laughs> I've never thought of it like that, but... I mean, that very well could be a possibility. I've never actually thought about it like that. Yo, man, I'm trying to help out the young kids that's listening, right? I'm trying to give them an argument here. Help me out. Help help me help their parents understand playing <laughs> Warzone is not a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely beneficial for me. But, um, and I, I, I can see. I can see it for sure. Okay, so we're going to do a few rapid-fire questions. And yeah, I yeah. want you to, first thing that comes to your mind, all right? 
Best defender you ever played against? Uh, Jeff Gladney from TCU. Yo, wow, that's a good answer. I didn't, wow, Jeff Gladney, TCU. Like, look at, look at you. Just pulling <laughs> him out. I like that. All right. Who is your favorite player over six feet? Uh, Julio Jones. Golly, there's another good one. Who is the best player at Purdue today? Offensively or defensively? Best player? David Bell. Okay. What is one thing about Coach Brom you think people should know that they don't know? I don't, I mean, he's, ask the question again. What's one thing that people don't know about him that they should know? They don't know about him. Uh, I don't know. I think he makes pretty much everything. I think he, he drives like a 2006 Honda. What? 2000, yeah, like 2005, 2006. He a millionaire. What's he doing driving a Honda? Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna have to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah, like, yo, a minivan? Nah, I said like a like, nah, not a like in a court? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I got I got I got questions for Coach Brom. I got questions for Coach Brom. But I'm all out of them for you, Rondell Moore. Thank you so much for joining us here on the number one ranked show. And I hope to see you drafted in the first round. I hope you have a pro football hall of fame career. And I am so excited to know that another young man like yourself is entering adulthood. Thank you so much, Rondell. No doubt. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Thank you, Rondell Moore, for joining us on the number one ranked show. I learned a lot about him, and I would have been so angry if you refused to round up for me on an 89.9. And, yo, who knew that the price of lumber was actually that high? That, that still floors me that he was thinking about that. Okay. Because Rondell Moore ran 4.29 in the 40-yard dash and can squat 600 pounds at about 180 pounds? Yeah, I wanted to do a top five list of the best NFL workout warriors of the last 20 years. So no, I'm not including Bo Jackson and his reported 412 or Deion Sanders and his reported 419 in sweatpants running backward. It just ain't, it ain't for me, right? I'm talking about the dudes that we've seen that we know. And at number five, I gotta go with the offensive line here, man. Tristan Wirfs at six foot five, 320 pounds, set records. All right, so I wanna make sure that I get this correct. The man had ran a 485 in the 40 yard dash. A man that is that tall and that large, moving that fast, is frightening to me. And then at Iowa, we're talking about a dude that could clean 450 pounds. He's saying clean 450 pounds for reps. Get out of here. Coming out of Mount Vernon, Iowa, was a Big Ten Offensive Lineman of the Year, a first-team All-American, and then, oh yeah, in his rookie season, he's got a Super Bowl ring. Yes, Tristan Wirfs goes on this list. Broad jumping 10 foot, one inch, like, that's nasty. That's sick. 36 and a half inch vertical. I need to get that in there because I can't jump 36 and a half inches off the ground, and I'm maybe one-third of Wirfs' size, yeah, one-third to be generous to myself, I guess. The next player on this list that I want to get to Calvin Johnson, all right, Megatron, because we didn't know what to make of Megatron coming out of Georgia Tech because the dude was playing wide receiver in a triple option look. Now, usually if you're playing flanker in a triple option look, you ain't that good, okay? There's a reason we stuck you out there and just said block down. Nah, he said, I want to play wide receiver, and Money said, you know what, you can do whatever you want, dog. You six foot five, 230 pounds, and you can move. And then we found out how fast he could move, right? My buddy Corey Hilliard played in the NFL for a few years, graduated Oklahoma State. He went to the combine with Calvin Johnson. He said he'd never seen anything like it. And to know that man is dropping 4'3", at 6'5", 239, yo! And then you saw what he did for the Detroit Lions. That dude is at number four. At number three, shout out to Jalen Hurts because the quarterback squat 600 pounds is just not, not anybody you want. Like, I don't, I don't want them hands. I don't want them hands. I don't want them thighs. And to see that that dude was doing that for Benny Wiley, who I know gets after people, you know that he was getting to the hole, he's getting past parallel, and that man is stout like you read about, indestructible. Jalen Hurts at number three, because quarterbacks squatting that much weight is just stupid. And then at number two, Quentin Williams. Another big, strong, fast man. We're talking about 4'8", 
in the 40 yard dash at 300 pounds. And then I watched what he did to Oklahoma in the 2018 Orange Bowl after he said, Kyler Murray ain't that good. And then tried to take it back because he knew he had overstepped, but the man was out there just telling the truth and shaming the devil, okay? He was eating up the Joe Moore Award off the Joe Moore Award offensive line of the year. And that is the award that is given to college football's best offensive line unit for the year. And yet Quentin Williams coming through there like a freight train at 4'8", using all them hands, using all that power to generate more power is scary, okay? I don't, I don't want them problems. And the one dude that I really don't want no problems with at number one, Saquon Barkley. Saquon, as christened by Odell Beckham Jr. Look, 28 inch thighs. Can squat 600 pounds. It's clean at 400 pounds. What are you doing, man? Like how strong do you need to be as a tailback? Quite honestly, he still got records at Penn State. I don't want no problems with no Saquon Barkley. I hope to see him playing well this year. I know that last year went into the dumpster real quick, but you know when they're that big, they're that strong, they play tailback, you want to see them out there playing. So at number five, Tristan Wirfs. At number four, Calvin Johnson. At number three, Jalen Hurts. At number two, Quinnen Williams. And at number one, Saquon Barkley. Those are my top five NFL workout warriors of the last 20 years. All right, I want to get into what is becoming one of my favorite segments, which is answering your questions, because we put out a call for you to ask me the question you want me to answer most, and you have responded with a treasure trove of really good and pointed questions for me to answer. And I want to start with at Tan Wilkes, who asked, who has the best wide receiver core in college football, and why is it Oklahoma? I love the and why is it Oklahoma, all right? Because this man understands, all right? Jaden Hazelwood comes out of Georgia, number one wide receiver for that class, 2019. Theo Wee's coming out of Allen. We understand what those dudes are about. And then seeing Marvin Mims show up after he set the national single season record for receiving yards in a year. Yeah, they good, but they're also good because they got this dude Spencer Rattler. But if you're going to actually argue about this and you want to pare it down to just two, you can look up North to Ohio State. Because between Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave, they just need to know that C.J. Stroud, Jack Miller, or Kyle McCord can throw it in the ball and watch what they do with it because they're that good. And prior to George Pickens going out with an ACL injury, I'm likely to pick Georgia here because Garrett Jackson is a dude. Jermaine Burton is a dude. And we all knew about Dominique Blaylock before the ACL injury, and I was looking forward to him coming back, being next to George Pickens. But I still think they're going to be plenty good because six foot seven. 260 pound Darnell Washington is out there just sunning people. They line that man up on the numbers. That's crazy. All right. Next question I want to get to is Joey Frass one comes from Joey Frass one. Excuse me, Joey. What's the best college football stadium in a, in a, not in a power five conference. Wow. There's a trick bag. All right. So for me, I need a little bit of story time. It's gotta be central Florida. Okay. Or in Orlando. And the reason I'm picked this, is in another life, I'm cheerleading at the University of Tulsa, male cheerleader, right? I'm throwing white girls in the air. That's my job. We on the bus. We rolling through. And they got the tinted windows on the bus so they can't see us, but we can see them. Didn't matter. The fans were standing outside that bus and they were booing the hell out of this bus. But I will never forget little girl in a Central Florida uniform sitting on her daddy's shoulder, double barreled at us, throwing the birds. And then we get to the stadium, and because the bleachers are still steel, they are pounding the bleachers. And you can hear this thunder rising, and they are getting after it in what is, in effect, a championship game for US, CUSA, best non-Power 5 conference that I've ever been to for a game. All right. Last one comes from Jay Magarmy? Magari? Mo Gary? Are we going Mo Gary G? Mo Gary 3. I think we're going to Mo Gary 3. Yeah. Stop the SEC bias BS in quotes. All right. There's a way to do this, okay? And it's got nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with people that do what I do either, right? Over here in quote unquote media. No. It's got to do with your team. You want to stop the SEC bias? You want to stop us talking about how good the SEC is? You want to stop me talking about Alabama, Georgia, LSU, ampersand U? Then beat them. Like for real. Like this is what I tell Oklahoma fans, right? Because I go hard 
on Oklahoma. And many of y'all already know that. But I go hard on them because when you show up, you get sunned by Alabama. You get sunned by LSU. You get sunned by Clemson. That can't happen no more, okay? You need your non-SEC schools to show up and beat the brakes off of Alabama, okay? Like, as much as we all wanted to see Alabama-USC because we remember that game that everybody credits Bar Bear Bryant was saying, this is why we got to integrate. Nah, nah, nah. You didn't want that. You didn't want that. That was going to be a bloodbath last year. We all know that. It's all right. It's cool. But that's what you're chasing. So if you want the SEC bias to stop and you want me to say good things about your team, have your team go to Alabama, go to Florida, go to LSU, go to Ampersand U, and come back with a W, all right? Go hunting, come back with a pelt. Till then, it's not SEC bias. It's just the truth, okay? It's just the truth. And as my man Jack Nicholson said in that one movie about the few good men and whatnot, some of y'all just can't handle the truth, okay? You just can't do it. Yes, until then, we order in the code red. That is going to do it for this episode of the number one ranked show. If you like the show, please rate it five stars, write us a review, get at us on Twitter at number one show. We're on Facebook, we're on IG. Let me know who you want us to talk with, what questions you want answered, and we will see y'all in a couple of days. Deuces. <laughs>